1947 was a remarkable year in UFO history, with the term flying saucer entering the national consciousness, an explosion of cases were brought forward, the likes of which had previously gone unreported. One of history's most famous cases occurred during this year, the Roswell case, covered in episode number 5. The cases in this episode include a number of CE2 and CE3 cases with more recorded witness testimony. The last half of this episode is an epic report of Albert Einstein being brought to Area 51 as part of the parade of top scientists that were brought to see this important technology acquisition. It's May 19th of 1947, and we're in Manitou Springs, Colorado. During their lunch period, a member of a train crew called attention to a silver object in the sky approaching from the northeast at a very great speed. All three men stated that the altitude of the object was very difficult to determine because of its apparent smallness. They further stated that because of this, it was difficult to view the object as being large and having high altitude, or small and being at a relatively low altitude. They did say, though, that it appeared to be higher than the top of Manitou Mountain, which is over 1,000 feet higher than the shops which are situated at its base. No definite shape of the object could be determined, and even with the aid of binoculars, it still could not be brought into focus. The binoculars used were of about 4 to 6 power. The men stated that they were certain that the object did not have any of the physical characteristics of modern conventional aircraft. On reaching the area just north of Manitou Mountain, the object remained in the immediate area for several minutes during which time it was seen to execute maneuvers such as climbing, diving, and reversal of direction of flight. This happened every few seconds. The distance and location between views prompted two of the men to think that there were more of the unidentified objects in the sky. At times, the objects seemed to hover in the air and then start on another path of flight. When last seen, the silver object was climbing very fast towards the west almost directly into the wind. June 21, 1947, Maury Island, Washington. Harold Dahl reported that, In the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, I was patrolling the East Bay of Maury Island. I was steering my patrol boat close to the shore of a bay on Maury Island. On board were two crewmen, my 15-year-old son, and his dog. As I looked up from the wheel on my boat, I noticed six very large donut-shaped aircraft. Dahl further claimed that one of the objects began spewing forth what seemed like thousands of newspapers from somewhere on the inside of its center. These newspapers, which turned out to be a white type of very lightweight metal, flooded to earth. Dahl reported that a substance resembling lava rocks fell onto their boat, breaking a worker's arm and killing a dog. Dahl said his superior officer, Fred Chrisman, investigated. Dahl also claimed he was later approached by a man in a dark suit and told not to talk about the incident. It's June 24th of 1947, and we're in the skies over Mount Rainier, Washington. Private pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying near Mount Rainier when he reported seeing a group of reflective craft moving at high speeds and flashing in the sun like mirrors. Bill Beckett of the East Oregonian, who first interviewed Arnold, summarized the sighting as nine saucer-like aircraft flying in formation. This introduced the term flying saucers, and Arnold's sighting sparked an explosion of UFO reports around the country. It's July 4th of 1947, and we're in Emmett, Idaho. At 8.04 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, United Airlines Flight 105 took off in a DC-3 from Boise, Idaho, bound for Pendleton, Oregon. In a sign of the times, on departure, Boise Tower jokingly suggested the crew be on the lookout for flying saucers. During the flight, co-pilot Ralph Stevens reported seeing an approaching light and turned on the DC-3's landing lights to alert oncoming aircraft. Stevens and Captain Emil J. Smith then reportedly observed what Smith termed four or five somethings. Smith described the objects as smooth on the bottom and rough appearing on top, but they could not say whether they were oval or saucer-like. 
One object was reportedly larger than the rest. The crew later witnessed what they interpreted as four additional objects. The crew reportedly witnessed the objects for 45 miles, or about 12 minutes, before they disappeared in a burst of speed, though the crew could not say whether they vanished by outspeeding the DC-3 or by disintegrating. It's July 9th of 1947, and we're in Meridian, Idaho. Just three weeks earlier, Kenneth Arnold's sighting had introduced the idea of flying saucers to the minds of Americans and the world. The aviation editor of the Idaho Statesman, David Johnson, was tasked with finding and reporting what Arnold had seen. Johnson and Arnold took the newspaper's small plane up to sea, but could not find anything. The next day, Arnold took up an AT-6 fighter plane from Gowan Field to keep searching as he was a member of the 190th Fighter Squadron of the Idaho National Guard. On his way back at 14,000 feet, he saw, off to his left side, a black round object. He pulled back the plexiglass cockpit cover to try and film it and got 10 seconds of video. Just after making the recording, the object turned on its side, revealing that it was a disc and not a sphere. It then began a series of rolling maneuvers before it vanished out of sight. When he got back to Gowan Field, he learned that others had seen the same object performing the same strange rolling maneuvers. The video only showed a tiny black dot in the distance. July 10, 1947, Ernest Harmon Air Force Base, Newfoundland. In June of 1947, Pan American Airways leased some DC-4s and started its first scheduled round-the-world flights, a major milestone in aviation history. At 5.30 p.m., three men, including two Pan American Airways mechanics who worked out of Harmon Field Army Air Force Base, were driving up a mountain road six miles south-southwest of the base when all three of them observed a circular silver disc at about 10,000 feet. It passed in horizontal flight along a great curved course. The disc's size, they stated, approximated the wingspan of a C-54 transport aircraft and looked to be cutting a bluish-black trail about 15 miles long as it literally parted a path through the clouds over Harmon. The trail passed over the base and out towards the north-northeast, being compared to the afterglow of a powerful searchlight when suddenly switched off. Some personnel of the 1388th at Harmon Field also saw this great cut made in the clouds and acquired two Kodachrome pictures taken by one of the mechanics who first witnessed the event. Known as the Harmon Field case, this incident received the first intensive investigation by Army Air Force Intelligence. The sighting became especially relevant to intelligence officials both at Wright Field and the Pentagon because of the concern of a Soviet connection to the saucer mystery. The reasoning basically followed the assumption that if the USSR was flying spy flights over the United States, the missions would logically have to pass over some areas of Canada or the far north. This sighting and a few others in the same time frame and trajectory stirred up a lot of concern about Soviet spy activities. It's July of 1947 in Zacatecas, Mexico, they have a close encounter of the third kind. In the desert, a rancher came upon a landed metallic rocket-shaped object on some scrubland. Inside a cabin or cockpit, he was able to see two short, man-like dwarfs wearing silvery coveralls. He apparently left the area and did not see the object apart. It's July of 1947 in Nashville, Tennessee, and there's a close encounter of the third kind. A man wrote the Nashville Tennessean that as he was driving along a highway, a flying saucer landed in a field, and two strange little men, all heads and arms and legs and glowing like fireflies, emerged from it and exchanged greetings with him by sign language. The saucer finally took off in a cloud of dust. It's July of 1947, and we're in Onfraville-la-Mivoire, France, and we have a close encounter of the third kind. 
A woman saw an oval-shaped gray craft sitting on the road at two kilometers from Amfreville la mivoire on the road to Rouen, parallel to the River Seine. She got to within 100 meters of the craft, which she says was of gray color and an oval shape with no crutches or landing gear. It had some kind of circular opening slightly at its back. The size of the object was estimated to be of one to two meters in height. Next to the craft were two beings about one meter in height who seemed busy at something, but the woman did not understand what they were doing. As the woman was traveling on her bicycle, she rang the bell when she was about 100 meters away to let them know she was coming. The two beings turn around and see her. They immediately rush to the object and go into the opening in the back. The object takes off silently and vertically up to 100 meters in altitude, remains motionless for a while while oscillating, and then zooms away to the southeast. It's July of 1947, and we're in the seas off of Malta. Fishermen on a boat 20 miles south of Malta were raising their nets with a catch of fish when they saw an object floating on the water's surface that looked like a black submarine. The fishermen were frightened because they thought it looked more like a monster than a submarine, so they quickly pulled in their nets and started the boat's engine. At that moment, a bright light from the submarine lit up the whole area, and the little men began running all over the deck of the object. The fishermen couldn't make out much detail from their boat, but whenever the light illuminated the little men, they could see some sort of apparatus around their waist. After a few minutes, the little men entered the submarine, which began to glow so brightly that the fishermen couldn't see the object. It then submerged. It's 1947, we're in Baru, Brazil, and we have a close encounter of the third kind. A group of survey workers ran away as they heard a hissing noise and saw a disc land 50 meters away. Jose Higgins saw two figures through a window. Later, three beings in shiny clothes and translucent suits with oversized bald heads, huge round eyes, no eyelashes or eyebrows, and a metal box on their back emerged from the craft. They were over two meters tall. They drew the solar system and pointed to Uranus as if to suggest that was their point of origin. It's 1947 and we're in Reveo, Italy. An Italian artist by the name of Rapuzzi Johannes was taking a leisurely walk in the mountains between Italy and Yugoslavia. He saw just in front of him a red glowing saucer. This saucer was about 30 feet wide and it was accompanied by two small dwarf-like creatures wearing dark blue coveralls with red collars and red belts. They had greenish hands and eight talon-like fingers. These creatures had very large heads with green faces, sort of resembling that of a fish. They also had a circle around each eye. They wore something similar to crash helmets. The center of their belts projected a vapor accompanied with an electric shock that left him so weak that he was almost paralyzed. After this incident, the creatures ignored Johannes and left. It's 1947 in Twin Falls, Idaho, and there's a close encounter of the second kind. Two boys and their father saw a sky blue object in the Smoke River Canyon 100 meters away and 25 meters above ground. Treetops under it were spinning wildly, although the object itself did not spin. It made a swishing sound. It looked like an inverted plate about seven meters in diameter and three and a half meters thick. There was a red flame on one side of the top. It's 1947, and we're somewhere in the skies over New Mexico. A Navy test pilot admits to a doctor that he was directed by a radar group to go check out a radar blip over New Mexico. He took our fastest plane out to go see what it was. He finds the craft and gets permission to shoot it down as it's flying away from the U.S.'s fastest airplane. The pilot shoots down the craft and lands his plane on a nearby road. He hops a fence and goes over to check out the craft. The door to the craft was open and one five-foot-tall alien was out walking around. 
As he went to investigate the craft, he was able to see through the walls. There were three other dead aliens inside the craft. The walls of the craft were semi-transparent and the floor was spongy. He knew the military would be showing up soon, so he took off in his airplane. It's summer of 1947, we're at Area 51, Nevada, and there's a rather interesting close encounter of the third kind. Albert Einstein visits Area 51, sees the Roswell disk that was recovered, and talks with an alien that survived the crash. The following is a transcript of a 1993 confession interview done by MUFON researcher Sheila Franklin of Shirley Wright, who was Albert Einstein's assistant during 1947. All I recall is several people using the word Roswell, and that must be where the crash occurred then. And then they brought them to the other place, and it looked like an airport facility where there was a rather good-sized building, hangar, where they had the spaceship and where they had the bodies. Was it an intact ship? No, no, it was badly damaged. Was there anything written on the ship? No, not anything I saw. No, not by the time I saw. Can you describe what it looked like? Did you touch it? Yes, they didn't let me do that, but the other people were permitted to do that because they were very curious about knowing what kind of materials they were. The body of the ship was what I would call today a reflective material, but when you looked at it and when you were close to it, it was rather dull. So it had to be energy reflective or translucent or a glowing. It was a disc shape and it was not too high, it was sort of concave. How big was it? Oh gee, let me see, I'm really bad at this. It was a large room and it was easily one-fourth of the room it was in. Were you able to go inside? No, I wanted to, but the others did go inside. Yeah, they went inside. I was not permitted to do that, not being one of the upper echelons. I was just one of the gophers, you know, going for this, going for that. I was nobody, I was nobody, but uh, they went inside. They also wanted to see the method of propulsion. They were interested to see if they had any other types of control device or communication devices or what kind of even things they had. For the journey, in other words, if they had come such a long distance, how were they able to do that and so forth? You know, what you and I would call food or respiratory gases. What did they use? They were very interested in identifying that. It is very much oddly like a lot of science fiction movies today. A lot of equipment, very trim along the perimeter, things that would come up from the floor automatically, pods would come out and things like that. Can you tell us about the beings and did they communicate telepathic? What kind of information was given? Did they ask you anything? Did you ask them anything? It was both ways. We asked them several questions and they asked us several questions. Not myself individually, not me particularly, but the people I was with. They wanted to know how long we lived. They wanted to know if there were any conditions that terminated our life. In other words, what you and I would consider diseases or stresses on our body to terminate our life. I can't believe my mind is so blank I thought I would never forget this stuff. They asked a lot of the scientists what was their best system of going out into the atmosphere or going into the ocean and how deeply we had penetrated galaxies, things like that. And of course, they were very quick to let us know that we didn't know anything. They did not menace us or threaten us at all because they knew right away that we were intellectually inferior and scientifically inferior. Then how was it that they crashed? Was there any information about that? If they have such technology, how is it that uh, something had gone wrong and that was one of the major things we asked them. We asked them what they ate. We asked them what kind of gases they needed. We asked them about their life support, their origins. We asked them what they used for propulsion. We asked them about some of their things. We asked them what they thought went wrong and why they were, first of all, even coming here. Why did they come to visit us? Do you remember what they said? If they are so obviously superior, why would they want to come to Earth? What did they say? Well, this one indicated, at least telepathically, it, well, they don't have a sex like we do, so I can't say he or she or something. It indicated that they were exploring intergalactic space, what we would call intergalactic space. He didn't call it that. They were in search of better stars than where they were. They were running into a problem where they are from because of some physical condition energy-wise. And they needed to go some other place. And we took it that they were looking to colonize some other place. And they were finding that Earth was entirely unsuitable to them. That's because they found out that we are not at their level at all. They had nothing to fear from us. Ha ha ha, I think they would have a lot to fear. They still didn't know what happened to their propulsion system that would have brought them down. They didn't exactly know. They knew that it was a malfunction of something, but they, they didn't know. And in fact, one big just on the verge of trying to go with a couple of engineers and scientists into more detail when it succumbed and they couldn't bring them back. 
was there only one ship or did they were they just uh, there by themselves as a scout ship or what? Were there any others in the Armada? They claimed there were eight, that a Maverick somehow lost position or something. I don't know if it was a time warp or whatever, but they got out of the direction that the others were even going. One ship he claimed crashed in Siberia in the same group. Of course, he didn't know what it was called, but we told him it's the United States. Did he say where they were from and what star system? And were they from this galaxy? They indicated to us that they were not from our galaxy, definitely not from our galaxy. And the uh, star system, the name was absolute gibberish to us. We didn't know what it meant. Was that at that point in time? Uh, do you have any knowledge whether we found that star system now? So far as I know, we still haven't found out. Um, and how many people were around when you were there? Were there government people? Were there other scientists? There was government people, there was military people, there were scientists, there were lower echelon people. There were many individuals about both men and women, many people. How did you get from where you were with the scientists you were with to that point of where the ship is? Military vehicles to the site. Were you interrogated at all before you were allowed to see this? No, because I was just sort of in the background and I, I was just, you know, I had no positive even fifth or sixth line interest in it or anything. I was just to be assisting the scientist I was with and part of his entourage, so to speak. And that's why I was there and just permitted to be there. How did you feel when you saw this and saw what was taking place? Well, I was quite overwhelmed and awed. I, I real or fantasy, I wondered whether somebody was playing a terrible untruth on us and it just that the people, there was such activity and interest on part of the people, I knew it was something serious. But otherwise, you'd think you're almost in part of a, some science fiction betrayal. I mean, you know, some set or something. Did you have a security classification at that point in time? Or they just let you in without any kind of... We all had security clearance. Was that immediately before you went there? Or had you had one when you were working with a scientist? I had one when I was working with Einstein. And then security clearance was respective. The only reason we could go. And did they deactivate it after? Oh, it was immediately deactivated. In other experiences you had, the other work you've done, did you ever have any other kinds of security clearances? I've never had a necessity since to have a security clearance, no. I have a, have a paper passed by the government on the ultimate structure of matter and a National Academy of Science, but I have no security clearance. Do you remember what they called that security clearance that you had? Did you have? Did they name it for you? I don't even recall that except for... I don't, I, I don't, I'd have to look that up. I, I don't know whether I even have a note on that. The program that you were working on with Einstein, was it funded by the government or was it a university grant? Grant to him at the university at that time to have outstanding students from around the country pick to work with him that particular summer in nuclear chemistry. Did you have a title that was, did you have a title that was given to you while you worked there? Special C. Did he take any other students with him? No, I was the only student. Lucky you. Ah, come on. I was his pet. I have to admit that I was, I was, I have to admit that. There were 29 and I wasn't the only girl either. When the last alien died, were you there at that point in time? No, I wasn't. I was back in the motel in a city nearby and I had been told they would be able to keep the being alive. Ah, how many were there originally? Nine. I saw nine. Eight bodies and later we communicated with the one so there were nine. And you could describe how they were? Oh, I sure can. I remember that very well. They were uh, a very light, soft, grayish green, really. And they had a slim, lean... They had no nose, but they had marking where a nose opening would be. They had eyes and a mouth. No eyebrows. They had ears. They had a very forehead. It was nice relative to the rest of their body. And uh, the ones that I saw were approximately maybe five feet tall, five feet five, something like that. They're small by what a man did on earth. What do their eyes look like? Their eyes were enormous. They were very prominent. They were the most obvious thing you would see on their face. Were there any pupils? I noticed, but I never saw any pupils. What color were they? They were almost a brown black. They were very, very dark. Were they all the same color in terms of the, ah, yes, um, did they have any kind of clothing on? Yes, they had suits on. What did they look like? Very much towards like what we would call a suit. The only thing was, though, that I didn't recognize the fabric. It didn't look like any fabric that I would know as a chemist or even today that I would recognize. Were there any kind of fasteners? You mean zippers or ties or something? No, I didn't see any. 
What about their shoes? Their shoes were all, looked like they were connected in one piece, and their, their hands, their limbs were covered, you know, right down to what we would call the wrist. What color was it? Were there any kind of trim? You mean the suit itself? Mm-hmm. Oh, it had like an insignia on it. What does the insignia look like? Gee, I'd have to draw it for you. It looked like, I'm not an artist, but it looked like something like this. I don't know what it meant. It's the insignia. The insignia was almost in the middle of the garment. It wasn't off on the side like we would expect it to be. Did they need any special breathing apparatuses, or were they? did they appear to be breathing on their own? They were breathing on their own, and that was one of the amazing things that we were starting about, where they could apparently survive in our atmosphere, and they had apparently come such a long way. Did they seem to indicate that their atmosphere was similar to ours for breathing? They asked us about that, and we asked them about it, yes, and they seemed to indicate, yes, that it is quite similar. It was not identical to ours, though, because they claimed they had made tests. Did they tell you anything about their lifestyle? We tried to find that out before we could, that they really, uh, we were very interested in not antagonizing them at all. So we got to the point where we had them answer too many of ours, and we never really found that out. We just knew that they don't live all above ground according to what they told us. A lot of there is what we would call subterranean. Did they seem repelled by our appearance since they look so different? Oh, they thought we were very odd. Since you indicated that they were either androgynous or had no sex, did they mention how they procreated? That was another thing we asked them, but we couldn't pin down either, but no, they indicated that they don't have sex the way we have at all. Did they tell you how they reproduce? Did they refuse or just nobody probed them? Nobody probed them. So they really were kind of limited in what they felt was appropriate to tell you? I would say so, yes. I would say they were very careful what they revealed. Did it seem like they wanted to have any kind of continued contact with this planet? Very definitely, yes. However, they had already almost discounted this as a desirable place to come.